I'm going to talk about the ischemia trial, and I just, it's important to know that I was uh, one of four PIs of the trial, and my area of uh, direction in the trial had to do with uh, the imaging centers, uh, just as an FYI. And Dr. Berman is gonna speak about a lot of the evidence that is pertinent to, to imaging. And I'm just gonna highlight uh, just very briefly um, some of the preamble evidence uh, as to what, was, uh, what the observational evidence uh, has suggested uh, prior to the ischemia trial. Now, before the ischemia trial was published, we saw observational evidence such as this on the left-hand side of the slide, showing that beyond a given amount of ischemia, moderate to severe ischemia encumbering 10% of the myocardium or greater, there was a, a basically having of coronary disease death uh, in patients who underwent uh, coronary revascularization. Now it's important, this is a very large study, it was extremely well done analysis, but it is observational. And of course there can be a lot of differences and nuances between the assignment of patients to revascularization versus medical therapy, et cetera. And also this was published and really data was derived from some 20 years ago. Although, and I would have thought prior to more recent publications that this data was perhaps somewhat stuck in time and wasn't relevant to current practices. But there have been several papers, as you can see on the bottom uh, and on the top right-hand side from Dr. Krishna Patel, who did a fabulous talk earlier on pet ischemia, as well as some data using the new CZT spec cameras, showing these same results of a reduction in risk with revascularization, but all from observational findings. Now, the stable ischemic heart disease trials up until somewhere around 2009, Courage and Barry 2 d failed to establish any difference in outcome between patients that were given contemporary optima, optimal medical therapy as compared to revascularization. These p-values aren't remotely uh, significant or borderline, and of course, I think Dr. Shaw talked about this very nicely, is that they're really the eligibility criteria were minimal uh, in terms of ischemia. And often the ischemia was very small amounts of ischemia and without what most people in particular, Dr. Berman, Dr. Jane and others on this call would say is prognostically uh, important. And in some cases, anatomic eligibility allowed for enrollment. So it wasn't the same as you can expect as we'll talk about just in a moment with the uh, FAME trials. There has been though, and it's, this is an extremely fundamental and important and, and patient-centered finding that we've seen throughout the literature. And that is that revascularization, PCI plus medical therapy is associated with a early, a prompt and durable improvement in angina. As we can see from the COURAGE trial, and we'll see later on in this presentation, an early and uh, through three years improvement in angina. This will be a consistent theme. Even as you talk about the FAME trial, now Dr. Shaw talked about this uh, and it was stopped early because of this potential hazard, this three component endpoint of all cause death, myocardial infarction and urgent revascularization. But of all of those three component endpoints, urgent revascularization was the lone significant uh, um, a variable of all of those three component endpoints that was significant, which was driving that difference in the medical therapy arm. Now the trial was stopped early, so it's really important that we see that five-year outcome data just published a few years ago in New England Journal, showing a maintenance of that uh, benefit with uh, FFR guided PCI to reduce that primary outcome. But importantly, so it's urgent revascularization. And as so, if we, if we think about this continuum of benefit of revascularization, it focuses solely on symptom relief, whether it be stable angina or in the case of fame, uh, that urgent revascularization, those instability or unstable symptoms associated with that. This is the, 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 the gamut upon which we can see and we feel very comfortable now with multiple uh, trials uh, showing revascularization is associated with symptom relief. But this is how where we come to uh, the ischemia trial. And here you can see the design on this. Everybody is well aware of this. So I'm gonna go through this rather quickly, but I'm gonna highlight areas that I think are important. One is the moderate or severe ischemia was determined by the site. It's interpreted by the core lab. We used a blinded CTA. 
to rule out left main. You certainly would not want to treat somebody conservatively with left main, at least right now with our current evidence, and to rule out non-obstructive disease, because we know ischemia and the setting of non-obstructive disease is real, and you see this often in your patients. The exclusion criteria on the lower left are fundamental to understanding the trial. We excluded left main, any, any uh, depressed ejection fraction. That's important because Stitch uh, covered that as well as I think notably patients who had ACS within two months or that those that had unacceptable levels of angina. So, and the, the uh, screen failures, uh, if you go down this slide, you look, the screen failures excluded patients with non-obstructive disease and left main. When the randomization was done before the cath lab, no other trial had done that. You were randomized to an invasive strategy versus a conservative strategy. And there are two components of this, which are fundamental to understanding, is that the invasive strategy had to have, was the, the aim was optimal revascularization. We've already heard some discussions about completeness of revascularization. That's going to rear its head in this discussion as well. In the conservative strategy, where cath was reserved solely for OMT or optimal medical therapy failure. So let's look at some of the results. Now, importantly, what you see uh, is a patient population largely with a preserved ejection fraction. This is already gonna give you a, a flare. When I saw these findings before this was published, I said, hmm, uh, a patient with moderate to severe ischemia with a preserved EF, it's gonna be a lower risk population. That's fundamental to what you're seeing. Although most patients had a history of angina, there were only about 30% of patients that had new onset or their angina perhaps became more frequent over the past three months. And yet on the right, you can see that this is a, these are patients with a lot of disease. Uh, roughly three quarters had multivessel disease. Here you see the qualifying stress test. This is the core lab interpretation. On the top left, you can see the, the criteria. Dr. Berman, I know, will go into this in more detail. About two years into the trial, we added on exercise ECG. The criteria are pretty complex. Uh, I think if you I highlighted in yellow the two relevant criteria, I think importantly that exercise ECG, the, the um, ECG criteria, I personally don't think are at the level of a risk associated with the other stress imaging modalities. And this is why we added on, you have to have a 70% stenosis in the proximal or mid section of a, a coronary artery. Um, you could see that uh, on the right, this figure, of uh, the nuclear echo and CMR, the, the number of patients that had moderate to severe and about 700 patients had insufficient ischemia. There was only one criteria for the ECG and that's why it's depicted only as severe. But let's look at the medical therapy arm because there's been discussion about statins and other types of medical therapy. And there are two messages that come from this slide. One is you would have to be concerned about pretreatment since uh, most patients were on statins, although not on high intensity statins. Uh, and most patients were on aspirin, high amount of patients were on ACEs or ARBs. There were no differences between the invasive and conservative strategies. And you can see you had, a, you had slight improvements in LDL, uh, systolic blood pressure, patients not smoking, et cetera. But this is a patient population that has a high degree of adherence to guideline best practices. And so we, we do have to be concerned about pretreatment and the level of improvement into what's called high level preventive optimization was about 40%. So it doubled uh, much more strongly adherent, but still a population which had a good degree of treatment already. Now, this slide, I think, is fundamental to thinking about the trial. You can see both for, for cardiac cath on the left and revascularization on the right. For cardiac cath, you can see that quite early on, there were a few patients, about one in 10 patients that had early event or perhaps OMT failure. Overall, about 30% of the patients in the conservatively treated arm, the medical therapy arm, had o o OMT failure and, cr and crossed over to cardiac catheterization. Now, for the most part, cardiac catheter catheterization was undertaken very promptly. Uh, but in the case of revascularization, what we see interestingly is only about half the patients underwent revascularization within six weeks. Now, certainly if you think about a patient with moderate to severe ischemia, there's often on the part of the stress imagers, this kind of acuity and promptness of care that they would like to see because they're concer concerned about the risk in the population. So we have to have a little bit more information about that. 
Why was that taken? It uh, wasn't taken very promptly. Could just be scheduling, but it's important for us to get a, a deeper dive on that. Now, only about 80% of the invasive group was uh, underwent revascularization. So that 20% included patients, about half of which had insignificant coronary disease and, and another group, the other quarter of that group um, actually had too extensive disease. Uh, so this is kind of interesting to frame the trial. It, these are strategy trials. So there's a lot of nuances to understanding these more complex strategy trials. You all have seen these. So I'm gonna go quickly through this because I think it's important for us to focus. Now these cur curves crossed so it was, uh, it's important to realize that that violates the proportional hazards assumption for that statistical analysis. So there's a lot of ongoing discussion about whether or not you could actually use a Cox model for that. But at four years, there was no difference in outcome, but you see this bump at six months. And Dr. Shaw talked about this. Uh, uh, Dr. Pandey alluded to this issue of procedural myocardial infarctions. We're gonna talk about this in a moment on the next slide. Uh, importantly, you see an early hazard and a late potential late benefit. Now the early ha harm, potential harm, I should say, related to revascularization has to be attributed to how much of that is completely revascularization and how much of other arteries were left uh, without in being intervened upon. But there's an er there's a interesting late benefit. And hopefully uh, the investigators, we have proposed a late, longer term follow-up. And I think if these curves continue to separate, it will be wonderful news for this longer term benefit. This slide perhaps gets overlooked a lot, but I, I think Dr. Shaw and, and, and Dr. Pandy talked about this, and I'm gonna just highlight very quickly. If you look at cardiovascular death, you don't see that same bump in procedural MI. So obviously this is telling us that these procedural MIs are not fatal, and therefore the clinical significance of that procedural MI has been questioned in many, many other trials and I think requires more uh, insight into understanding what's going on in the, the, the size of these non-fatal myocardial infarctions. The spontaneous MI, you could see these curves start to uh, separate at one year. Uh, I think this is gonna be fundamental to uh, understanding the trial and, and Dr. Pandy, I believe, or Dr. Shaw, I both mentioned a meta-analysis that was published in circulation that talked about this non-procedural MI benefit with revascularization, which is really, really important uh, from a patient-centered perspective. There were no heterogeneity of treatment effects, both in terms of the severity of uh, coronary disease, proximal LAD disease, the severity of ischemia. This was surprising to all of us. We certainly need a deeper dive into this. The, my final couple slides, I just thought I'd share with you, I think what, what is the most important, particularly from your patient's perspective, and that is the improvement in angina, whether or not the patient had daily, weekly, or monthly angina. We can see at three months, a clear separation in the blue line from those patients that were treated with medical therapy alone versus the, the invasive arm in red. And that difference uh, is, is clear across all the different patient populations with daily, weekly, or monthly angina. And these differences uh, were not seen in the patients who don't have angina to begin with, uh, but they, they do persist over 12 and 36 months. But that same no difference in angina does not, it is not shown through 36 months. And so I think what you can safely say throughout all the trials, and this is really important, I know we'd like to see more patients um, uh, surviving and show a, a benefit with cardiovascular death, but I, I, I do believe that this is a really important improved angina control with invasive strategies is important. Asymptomatic ischemia, that same benefit doesn't occur and this is consistent across all of the stable coronary disease trials. So the strengths, very large trial, randomization prior to invasive angiography, core lab interpretation for ischemia severity and CTA, similar medical therapy in both arms, a high rate of follow-up. I'm really worried about the inclusion of lower risk patients, which always happens in these larger trials, most with the normal EF, most mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic in the prior month. 14% had insufficient ischemia, um, and then the exclusion of those with left main stenosis perhaps uh, is receiving some focus. One more slide in my summary slide is to focus in on the results. Prompt invasive strategies don't reduce risk. 
uh, but they do actually improve engine control, which I think is a strong uh, support for invasive strategies. But I do think there is a strong message for optimizing medical therapy and, a, and a, I think a, a greater focus on symptom relief as a primary aim of care uh, should ensue with this. I think CTA, has shown itself, particularly there's a lot of strong leaders in CT in India, as we've seen on, on discussions on this uh, on this slide today, on this talks today. It's CTA is accurate to detect left main and exclude non-obstructive disease, where Dr. Narula and I are actually developing a grant to actually analyze the atherosclerotic plaque, which I think will be fascinating to see, particularly about the procedural and MIs or even the spontaneous MIs. We do need some more data on completeness of revascularization. And I think the longer term follow-up is a must for us to see if these cur treatment curves continue to separate. So thank you so much for your attention and allowing me to speak with you today. Thank you.